So we are in a new series called Concrete. Somebody say Concrete. So our verse for today, Delvin, is going to be Matthew chapter 23. We're going to go to verse 28. Um, before I read that, let me give some context. So I say that we're in the season of concrete, or excuse me, the sermon series of concrete. So we started off in a series called It's Bigger Than Me, and then we jumped into unbelievable, and we went through the miracles of God because God was wanting our faith to rise in this season. It is hard for some of us to come to church and to hear about what God wants to do in our life, and it does not take root. So one of the things that God has been doing, especially through this first year of our church, is strategically put in sermon series that are going to lay the foundation of where we're going. Somebody say going. We headed somewhere. And so after we went into the season or the sermon series of Unbelievable, we jumped over into house rules. We said, God was saying that, man, we've seen so many people give their life to Jesus or so many people rededicate their life to Jesus. Or we have so many people here who have considered themselves saved for a long time. But we were saying, how do we practically walk this out? What does it look like as an everyday citizen in the kingdom? What does it look like for me to live this life and to prioritize God first? So in this series called House Rules, it wasn't just talking talking about our house. It was talking about the big house. It was talking about the kingdom. Somebody said kingdom. So we had that there were four specific duties and responsibilities that we have as kingdom citizens on how we can walk this out every day. The first ones we talked about prayer. The second thing is we talked about giving. The third thing was sharing. And the fourth one was serving. And so that is actually where we put in our 90 day challenge to on the end of that. And so then after that, we jumped into concrete. And what is that? House rules was universal responsibilities and duties that we have within the kingdom. Concrete is what does the vision and the values that God have here for Blueprint. Amen? Amen. So what we said is this here. Write this down. I taught on culture last week a little bit before we jumped into love. Um, But the thing is this, is that culture is formed by what you design it to be or what you allow it to be. Culture is designed, or excuse me, it is formed by what you design it to be or what you allow it to be. So this is the thing. One of the things we said last week, and I'll say it again today. There is a culture in your life. There is a culture in your marriage. There is a culture in your workplace. There is a culture in your life. There's a culture of your personality, and you either intentionally form that or you unconsciously let it be formed upon you. I'm going to step on toes. Don't worry about it. If we start looking at our life and some of our relationship and we start wondering, how did I get into this place? How did I start allowing this? How did this, how did this become the culture of our relationship? There's some of us that we like toxic relationships. That's a culture that you let be formed on you or you intentionally formed it. Okay. Some of us are super bad with our money or are super bad in the areas of finances that we just spend, spend, spend. That is a culture that you formed or you let marketing impress that upon you. This is the thing I talked about at one point in time uh, a couple weeks ago is that we are consistently being discipled whether we think it or not. And it is more important than ever for us to be intentional and concrete about our values and about our culture. Because if we don't, other people will tell us what our culture needs to be. I'm sick of people who are not Christians telling Christians what to do. Amen. There's so many people who don't go to church, who hate the church, are trying to tell the church how the church should be. You don't read your Bible. Stop talking. Hear me when I say this, is that we have to be intentional about your culture. If you're not intentional about the culture of your life, if you're not intentional about the culture of your marriage or the culture of your business, if you're not intentional about the culture of your church, other people will set it for you and then you'll have to live by it. Or you'll have to break it. And with that is that a lot of us are addicted to comfort and so we will not break the concrete things in our life. We'll just have to live underneath it. So what we're doing now is we are saying intentionally, Master, intentionally, Kel, what we're doing is that we're setting a foundation because everybody knows you have to build on a solid foundation. It has to be concrete. That God is building something within our church in specific and within your life. And if you have a faulty ground, you'll fall for anything. We'll fall into anything. Not here. That's not what we're doing. Our culture should be so strong. That's why we call it concrete. Is that, that, that when people come in here, I promise you, not just people, y'all, we will change before it does. We, yeah, run into concrete if you want to. It ain't budging. We want to be so loving that if people want to walk in here hateful, they'll change or they'll have to leave. Amen. That we want to be so generous, that we want to be so authentic. 
that we want to be so real, so loving, so caring with people that our culture literally brings transformation to lives into the city. We want to go out. That is part of our mission. So our culture has to be concrete. Say concrete. It will be a catalyst. There are three jobs that we have in here. Write these down. There's three jobs that we have as churchgoers, but especially and specifically for those of us that are builders and owners of this culture here at Blueprint. There are three jobs that we have in specific. Number one, it is to build the culture. Say build. The second one is to spread. Somebody say spread. spread. We're going to spread the culture or sustain it. Amen. I knew y'all had it. And then the third thing is, is we're going to protect. Somebody say protect. Yeah. So it is our job in the early stages to pick up a shovel to make sure that we're building this, con this concrete culture. That we're saying, hey, we're going to be with love. So that means that we have to be spreading love everywhere that we go. That within this building and outside of this building, we are going to be sp spreading the culture of love and of authenticity. And then when we move on to sustaining it, that we have to keep it going. It is easy to start something. It's hard to keep it up. Amen. That's why that, that, ooh. some of us, our relationships start off, people love bomb. It's easy in the beginning. It's flowers. It's good morning text. And then it's bonnet. <laughs> we start stuff in the beginning. We got to sustain the culture. And lastly, we have to protect it. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 23. I see I stepped on some of y'all. Matthew chapter 23. Let's read this verse. Y'all with me today? All right, let's do it. Matthew chapter 23, verse 28. It says this, outwardly, this is Jesus speaking, outwardly, you look like righteous people. He says, upon first look, you look righteous. That, that from what it is that I can perceive, Chelsea, you look like righteous people. But inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Outwardly. That upon first glance, that if I just get to observe you from the outside looking in, you look like a righteous person. You look like righteous people. Jesus is speaking here, Jai. He's speaking to the Pharisees, and there's a large crowd of people around. I'll give context a little bit more on it later. But he's speaking to this large crowd, and he said, hey, you look like righteous people. That, that, that if I just can see the, the, the representative that you show me, you look righteous. If I can see the, the customer service agent that you present to me, you look righteous. If I can show, the, if, if, if I just look at the actor that you've shown me, you look righteous. But inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help me to preach this today. I pray, Father God, that our hearts would be open. I pray that you would move in the only way that you can move. Let me decrease so that you might increase. Um, and we thank you for every mother in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say Amen. So we're going to talk about the culture value of authenticity. Somebody say authenticity. authenticity. So authenticity is something that has been desired and talked about since the beginning of time. Everybody wants something real. Everybody says that they need something real. Mary J. Blige shouted from the mountaintop. She said, I need that real love. I'm searching for real love. The thing is, is that everybody, y'all know he working on me, but... <laughs> that, that everybody wants something real. Y'all can open up y'all Facebook right now if y'all stick it on it or Twitter. Somebody's posting right now about how people are fake and how people are not real. It's always something happening. I want to give you three definitions that I found, Webster, of, of authentic. And then we're going to go into a little bit more. Number one is this, representing one's true nature or beliefs. True to oneself or to the person identified. Authentic is not false or copied. It's genuine and real. Lastly, this is my favorite. It is being actually and exactly what is claimed. Actually and exactly what is claimed. Why are we bringing this up? Because people are drawn to authenticity. People crave authenticity. I'll be honest with you. One of the reasons why our church is growing so fast, I believe, other than the hand of God on it, is because we have an authentic church. That we have, that, that there's something, some of y'all have come up, man, hundreds of y'all have come up to me, my wife, or different people on our leadership team, and say, I don't know what it is. I just walk in here, and it just kind of just feels real. I feel like, like it's just non-judgmental, that there's something in this place that we're breaking barriers. People are, dr are, are, are driven, that they desire authenticity. It is something that draws people in I don't know about y'all, uh, but my wife and I, uh, we restarted the best show ever, a show called Martin. All right. 
Praise God, right? And, and so we, we started the show. We started Martin, and, and, and when we started rewatching it, we came to this episode to where one of Gina's old friends that she came to the picture, her name was Monique. And, and Monique always talked about how she kept it so real. All she did was keep it real, and she was a vegan, so she said, and that she wrote books, and that she, was, she managed her money, and she did all these things the right way. And then Martin and Pam, that they got an idea, they got word that, that Monique wasn't really living the way that she said that she was living, but everybody was drawn to her. Everybody was following Monique, and so Martin brings her on the show, and then he's interviewing her, and he's talking about, he's like, hey, so you say that you're vegan, huh? And she said, yeah. He's like, well, explain this, and he pulls back a picture of her eating a slab of ribs, right? And then he begins to expose her in all these areas. And people in the crowd who came to see her, who came to get autographs, they wanted to fight. They were mad. They all wanted to leave. They stormed off. They were so disappointed. Pastor Matt, why is this important? Because as fast as authenticity will draw people to you, hypocrisy will make them leave even faster. People will leave a situation when they start poking holes and they say, this ain't what I thought it was. How many of us have been in a relationship before you started dating somebody and all of a sudden some of y'all ended up marrying them, but you like, this ain't what I thought it was. That, that, that you went on a job interview and they started talking about all these things. They said everything that you needed to hear and they said this is what the culture looks like and then you got there you say, this ain't. <laughs> some of y'all want to quit right now. Don't do that. Don't quit yet. This ain't what I thought it was. That, that, that you got into a friend group that you might have saw some friends that, and, and y'all became, you know, you know how, how y'all girls do. Y'all get friends with people on Instagram and then y'all end up meeting later. You know. <laughs> no, let me stop. <laughs> but you end up getting around people and you're like, man, this ain't, this ain't what I thought it was. You've been living life with a filter on. You've been living life showing me what it is. It's, you, you've been showing me all the right answers but when I get up close and personal, I'm recognizing this ain't what I, this ain't what I thought. That, that from the outside, from the appearance perspective, you look and you say, and sometimes you can even do all the right things, but when I really get to know you, this ain't what I thought it was. We have an authenticity problem, and, and for some of us, honestly, we struggle with that. If you can't say amen, just say ouch. But, 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 but the thing is, is that we desire, we desire for authenticity, and we'll effectively communicate it, but rarely execute it ourselves. That we become chameleons. We become actors. You know one of the greatest reasons why people struggle to be vulnerable and authentic with others? is two reasons. It boils down to pride or insecurity. I either don't feel like you deserve the real me or, I'm, or I feel like if I give you the real me, you'll reject it. And I'm not proud enough, I'm not secure enough in who I am to give you my real self regardless of whatever you think. Some of us have been, in, have been actors for so long we forgot the real person. Better actors than Leo. Better act, been an act, Denzel in your relationship. Angela Bassett on the job. I'm, I'm speaking real. Don't even recognize, or your partner don't even recognize you. You may not recognize them. We've been actors. We can't be that here. God has called us to be an authentic people. God has called us to be an, an, an authentic and as Christians. He's called us to be authentic followers of the kingdom. And this is the thing right here. What I'm not saying is that it, it, is to walk in here and say, oh, I'm going to just be who I am. No, that's not it. What we're saying, because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says that any man who be in Christ is a new creature. A lot of times what we want to say is we use, I'm just being authentic. We want to justify a bad character trait. You can't argue Respectfully, you start cursing people out of hurting their feelings and, oh, that's just the way I am. The devil is a liar. Oh, I just can't control. You shouldn't have talked to me like that. No, you need to grow up. Can't control your lust. You need to grow up. Amen. Amen. <laughs> can't con yeah, so I, I, I Listen, I know my church. <laughs> can't control our financial spending. Oh, that's, oh, that's just how I am. I, 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 I got to get me. No, we're not saying to be committed and authentic to your flesh. We have to be committed to the authentic to the things of the spirit. This is where spiritual maturity comes in. So the thing is, is that when we get to Matthew 23, verse 28, we see that Jesus is having a conversation. I, I love, I love reading the Bible because one of the things about the Bible is I get to eavesdrop on conversations that I wouldn't get to be a part of. See, there's something about 
um, and, and this is a key to anybody who, who is in leadership or desires to be in leadership. One of the greatest things that you can do is just serve your way. Because one of the things that, that, that serving people and serving in, or serving leaders or eventually becoming a leader is grace is you get access to conversations that you typically wouldn't get access to. That you get privileged to hear things. And one of the things that we get access to through the Bible is we get to see and hear conversations that Jesus or the apostles are having with others that we can learn from. And so what happens is, is in Matthew 23, Jesus is having a conversation with the disciples and with the crowd. Even, um, Ebony, if y'all can throw 20, uh, verse 1 through 4 up there right now, I want to read that to y'all. Because before I even give context to where we're at for verse 28, we have to read this. It says, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the Pharisees are present. The teachers of the law are present. He says, the teachers of the religious law... And the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. They are right. He's saying, hey, that these people that are here, they're the pastors. They're the ones that we have commissioned. They're the official ones. They're the ones that I have put in place in order to teach you. But verse 3 says this. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. For they, they don't practice what it is that they teach. That is the equivalent of this. That's the equivalent of somebody walking up in this church right now saying, hey, Pastor Matt, can I see the mic? And I say, yeah, go ahead, player. And he takes the mic and he said, listen, hey, he is supposed to be the pastor here. He preaches right. He talks right. Everything that he says. But whatever you do, listen to him, but don't do what he does. He's great at communicating it to you. He's horrible at living it out. Don't do what he does. That's what Jesus is doing. Embarrassing them. Yeah, you teach her every, every Sabbath. Don't execute any of her life. And he goes down through the next 25 verses or so, and he, he talks about, he's saying, hey, you even tithe, but you don't love. Yeah, 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 you pray for long hours. You even have these cloths that you put on, these prayer robes that have verses written on the inside of them. And you walk around and you parade these things, and, but, but your heart is far from me. You do all the right things and nothing with the right intention. You're... A hypocrite. He said, he said, y'all are like whitewashed tombs. So back there in, 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 in Judaism and in, in that old Jewish culture, what would happen is, is that they would have these tombs and, and what they would do is they would decorate the outside to oper, um, to, to exemplify cleanliness. And what he's saying is that you're just like them, that you look good on the outside and you dead on the inside, that you're, you would much rather look the part than be the part. We have a culture, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me even bring this into nowadays. We have a culture of people who would rather look happy in their marriage than be happy in their marriage. I would much rather look like I got money than have money. And you might say, oh, I don't do that. Well, people post like it. We want to show people this representative. We want to show people like, hey, look, let me, let me do the right thing. Let me check all the boxes. I know how to greet people when they walk in. I'm going to talk about them when they walk out. I know how to serve in this place, but my heart is far from it. I'm going to serve and I'm going to smile and shake my pastor's hand. I'm going to talk about him when he walks away. I've seen it. That's a thing. We can check all the boxes. What he's saying is that you do everything to appear like you're authentic, but everything that you do is not. Internally, you're a hypocrite. Pastor Matt, why are you saying this? Because we're talking about culture. We're talking about who God has called us to be. And before we ever talk about biblical and godly authenticity, because there is a thing, D, is we have to show how God feels about unauthentic, uh, inauthenticity, hypocrisy, public school. Right? We have to show the opposite. Because God isn't pleased. Jesus was going off. He's sitting there saying, you are the people who are supposed, he said, you religious leaders. You are culture setters. You are the ones that people come to to see how should they live and you're fake. People are coming to you and saying, hey, one day I want to be like one of y'all and they don't know that you're dead inside. That you'd much rather look like you're doing it right. you much rather look like you know and the craziest thing is, is you know the information. You know what to do, you just choose not to do it. What are you choosing? It's a problem. It's a problem. And Jesus is fed up. And let me tell you that. He's still fed up. Because we still do it in the church. We still do it in the word. In the world. God is calling us to a different level of authenticity. There is a way that we're to execute this here in this church. I can't speak. 
not the pastor of the church. I'm the pastor of this one. I can only speak for what we're going to do in this house. We're going to love people. We talked about that last week, and we're going to be real. We're going to be authentic to the core. It is who we are. And we're not going to budge for nothing. We have to be. One of the sayings that we have, you can write this down, that we are real people having real encounters. So what does that mean? That your representative is not welcome here. Your customer service agent is not welcome here. The filtered you, that's not welcome. You know who is welcome? You. The you that is broken at times. That's why I try to get up here and tell you all times, like, man, today has been a week, or this week has been a week. I don't wake up every Sunday excited to preach. And life is tough sometimes. All lunch Sunday, my daughter cried all night. All night. I turned to fast. I said, you think we can push lunch to the mall? <laughs> she said, it didn't work like that. We got to be authentic. So there's three ways because there is a such thing. We talked about what is bi biblical inauthenticity or biblical hypocrisy. But we have to establish how can we be biblically and godly authentic. Amen? So there's three pillars, pillars to creating and sustaining an authentic culture. Number one is this is that we stay true to our core values. In the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2, verse 49, it says, and he said to them, this is Jesus again, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I'm, I must be about my father's business? Jesus is asking them a question. He asked them two in specific, why did you seek me? And did you not know that I must be about my father's business? What happens is, is that Jesus is in the midst of moving and Jesus is in the midst of, of, of uh, executing the will of the father. And people are calling him, trying to get him off mission. And Jesus said, hey, don't come to me. I got to stick to what it is that God asked me to do. And if I could tell you some of the tension and frustrations in your life is because you let other people's emergency become your urgency way too often. Anytime somebody needs something, you turn your eyes right off of the mission. We have to stay true to the core values. Who am I? One of the reasons why we get tossed to and fro is because we don't have no core values. That's why I said that as a church, we have to be intentional. You will either design your culture or it will be designed for you. We have to establish what is the culture of our marriage? What is the culture of my life? What type of person am I going to be? And I have to be committed to it. Hear me on this. Even when it's not comfortable. Because my core values are non-negotiable. My core values don't change because you make me mad. Let me, let, let, let me be transparent with y'all because you know we said we're a real church. I, I've had to apologize to people that wronged me because I didn't respond the way that I should respond to them wronging me. There were people, see, because I, I have said in my life, now I'm nowhere near perfect, but I've always said I don't want to be a person that, that, that my reaction, that my actions are always predicated on others' actions towards me. I had somebody disrespect me. I'm not going to tell you what I did, but I didn't handle it the right way. <laughs> Praise God. And I had to call him. Say, hey, bro. Sir, that's on me. You did what you did. I get to control how I am. And I never, ever want to be so flippant that I allow your immaturity, your inability or your wrongdoings to make me be somebody that I'm not. We have to be committed to our core principles. These values that we talk about over the next six to eight weeks, these are non-negotiables. This is who we will be at Blueprint. We will love people into transformation. We will love people at their worst. We will love people with our best. That is the culture. Hard stop. We will be authentic in who we are. We have to be committed to these things even when it's not comfortable. This is who we are. Number two is this, is that we are intentionally and authentically vulnerable. Being vulnerable with others will not only create a culture of vulnerability, but it subconsciously liberates others to do the same. There is, I, I, um, I was a sociology major in college, and there was a theory or concept that is called authentic vulnerability. Authentic vulnerability. And what that is, and, and, and the, the gist of the concept is this, is that when you are transparent and genuinely vulnerable with others, that 
that something psychologically happens when people can feel that you are sharing with them, that it automatically gives them an inclination to want to be vulnerable back. The thing is, is that in church or in the world at times, since everybody is walking around guarded, I am convinced that's because nobody wants to go first and be vulnerable first. So what we do is we have a bunch of people who walk in churches who have their guard up and they feel like they have to be everything that you think that they should be and they're hurting inside. We have to be authentically and intentionally vulnerable with others. Now, I'm not telling you to go and shout your business from the mountaintops. But if you're hurting, you got to let people know you're hurting. If you're broken, you got to let people know that I'm broken. I, I hug somebody today. I say, how you doing? She said, I'm not good. Thank you. I was there to hug her, and she cried in my arms. This was an hour ago. We cannot be as church that refuses or dismisses people's authenticity and their vulnerability. And one of the ways that we create that culture is we have to go first. We have to go first. Because one of the things is this, is that your vulnerability is not about them. It's a superpower for you. Let me give you scripture for it since y'all want it. In the book of 2 Corinthians, we see that Paul, or before I, yeah, before I even get to that, Paul says this. Paul says that in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. He said, so I would much rather, Paul said, I learned something. That in the midst of me being weak, in the midst of me being vulnerable, in the midst of me showing my inadequacies, in the midst of me showing my deficiencies, I recognize that there is a greater strength that comes upon me from the Holy Spirit. So he said, so I will much rather boast in my infirmities. I will boast and brag in my weaknesses. Because when I am weak, therefore I am strong. Paul said it like this. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing that I do, I forget what's behind me and I strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What is he saying in the, in, in the New King James Version? He says, I have not considered myself to have apprehended it. He says, I have not gotten it all the way yet. Paul is set in culture, so Paul was, was, was a serial church planner. And they used to call him the great apostle, the super apostle. Everybody looked in, and, and they saw him and they fell in love with him. And what he's saying in this moment is he said in the culture, say, hey, I'm going to let y'all know I ain't got it all the way together either. If you go through a thread, Zoe, of Paul's writings, Paul is consistently being vulnerable with his audience. He goes into the book of Romans in chapter 7. He says, I do not do what I want to do. And what I don't want to do, I do. And everything that I desire to do, I cannot do. And, and I recognize that there is this wretched, that there's this evil thing in me that's sin here, but I know that I'm loved by God. So I agree that the law is good, but there's something in me that I try to do and I can't do. He's being vulnerable. He's offering it up. We have to be a church that is intentionally, deliberately vulnerable with each other because God can't heal your representative. That person's not real. Pastor Donald told a story about his son, my nephew, who skinned his knee. And he was sitting on the sink. And Donald was like, hey, Pastor Donald said, hey, son, I got to clean it. And he kept crying. And he kept moving. He said, no, 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 I don't. And he said, son, I can't, I can't do nothing if you won't let me touch it. I can't clean it if you don't let me touch it. Some of us walk to God in the same manner. We walk in relationships in the same manner. I'm hurting and I hope that you would do something for me, but I'm not going to let you know that. I'm going to be this way. Intentionally and deliberately vulnerable. Our last point is this, and I'm going to close. And Clint, you can come up here. Is that we create a place that is safe for authenticity. We create a place that's safe for authenticity. So one, we're going to stay true to our core values. Two, we're going to be intentionally and authentically vulnerable. Number three, we're going to create a place that's safe for authenticity. It's imperative that we create this environment. We have been taught to only present our filtered version or the best parts and most attractive parts of us because we've been subconsciously taught that anything that's less than attractive will be rejected. There are people... Hear me on this. There are people, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that there are people who have wanted to find a church 
but, afraid, but were afraid that I could not walk in there because I know that I'm struggling. We have to be a place that creates a space. I think about the man in Mark chapter 3. He had a withered hand. He was paralyzed. And the Bible says that Jesus was teaching on the Sabbath in front of everybody. And he looks at the man in the back and he says, hey, come up here to the front and stand in front of everybody. I can't imagine this man with withered hand and ashamed, been overlooked, made fun of, ostracized. And he said, hey, stretch your hand forth. And Jesus healed him. We have to be a church that can say, hey, I don't mind seeing your withered hand. Sitting in the back, addicted to pornography, would never come up here and say that. See, we are okay with accepting the things that don't really bother us too much. Oh, you got an anger problem. Cool. You got a little lust problem. But there are things that people struggle with that are embarrassing to them, that are hurtful, that have their gut wrenching, some of their worst moments in their life. And how many people have we forced into a continual lifestyle because they're too ashamed to present it to us? The most impactful, one of the most impactful one of the most heartbreaking and one of the most proud moments of my entire time in ministry was about a year ago, there's a young lady that I grew up with. Uh, and I think she moved to like Florida, some I don't know. But I was working and I was at a sales meeting at a lunch, one-on-one. I'll never forget, it was a customer from Shell and I'm sitting at lunch with him, and my phone begins to ring. And I look, and it's a FaceTime. One, this person never calls me. Two, they definitely don't FaceTime me. I'm like, what's going on? So I said, hey, man, can, I, can you give me a second? I got to answer this. He said, yeah. I'm walking. I swipe, and I answer. And I said, hey, is everything okay? And she's wailing, crying inaudibly. I cannot even know. I don't even know what she's saying. I can't even understand it. And she's saying, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I'm like, hey, baby, you got to calm down. Like, I don't know. Like, like, what are you saying? I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I said, take some deep breaths. I couldn't. And I finally got to make out what she was saying. She said, I just couldn't keep his baby. I couldn't do it. I couldn't live with that. I know he hates me, but I couldn't. I, I know God doesn't want to talk to me. And as I started recognizing, I started looking through the tears in her eyes. The camera moved back a little bit. And I seen she was in the doctor's office. She had a gown on. She just had an abortion. Hadn't even left. And she is screaming in this place, crying. She said, you're the only person that I could call. I didn't know what to say. I said, are you okay? And she just kept saying, I know God hates me. I know I can't go nowhere. I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know what... I don't know what to do, but I, you're the only person that I felt like I could call. It's the only place that I felt was safe. It broke my heart. I'm looking at her in the worst moment of her life. Low, hurting, thinking that her life could potentially be over, thinking that God has thrown her away and trashed her. And she called me. We sat on the phone. She said, can you just pray for me? I prayed with her. I told her I loved her. I told her she's not a decision. I told her that God loves her. I told her that we'll, we'll move from here. She called me in that moment. And months later, the only thing I could think about was that she thought I was safe. After whatever interactions that we had, she looked at me and said, we may not talk often, but I can tell him this. And this isn't a brag on me. This is the culture that we have to have. Now, can I give you an update? This young lady still on the East Coast. Gave her life back to Jesus. Is in leadership. Have led tens and 20 of people to Christ since that moment simply because 
she found a safe place. Hear me when I say this. Blueprint has to be a place where people can walk in here with their gown on. Blueprint has to be the place that they said, I know that I, I don't know what's going on in my life and I'm wrong, but this is the only place that I can come because we transform people into love. That in people's most broken states, we plant seeds of love that grow in transformation. And hear me on this. Transform lives. Transform people. Let's be a place. Let's commit to, to creating, sustaining, and protecting a culture that sticks to our core values, that is intentionally and deliberately vulnerable, and that is that creates a place that is safe for people to walk in on their worst and end up being their best. With every head bowed and every eye closed, there's no safer place than the arms of Jesus. There's no safer place than being in his will. There's no safer place than being connected. So if you're in this place and you said, hey, I have never given my life to Jesus. But today, I need to go where it's safe. Today, I want to be transformed. Today, I want to be in his will. If you're in this place, you've never given life to Jesus and you want to, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. Amen. I see your hands. Amen. Thank you for that. I see the hands all the way in the back, over here on the right side too. Amen. Amen. And lastly, you might be saying, hey, I have given my life to Jesus. But I walked away. And I found myself in a place that I did not recognize. I'm somebody I don't even know. But today, I'm going to come back to where it's safe. If you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. Come on. Hands all over the place. Be authentic and vulnerable. Amen. I see you over there in the back. Amen, amen. Listen, I want everybody to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, come on, let's say it like you mean it. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I believe that Jesus, that he lived, that he died, and that he rose from my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. I am yours, and you are mine. In Jesus' name. Come on, give him a shout of praise, y'all.